The series opens with a view of Enlau House and we hear a radio announcer informing that it's going to be another beautiful, boring day in Lao. Inside it's a normal enough breakfast scene. Well, a former FBI agent and a former military special forces soldier is cooking eggs for his children. Bram and Gracie. After a while, Katie, his wife comes in, looks at a picture on the fridge and kisses the kids. Bram then goes out to pick oranges from the tree in the garden. While he's there, a razor wire on top of the fence can be seen, subtly pointing out that not everything is as normal as it seems. It is then revealed that the Earth has been invaded and colonized by a mysterious alien force named the Visitors. This event has been named the Arrival. Los Angeles is a police state surrounded by a gigantic wall. On the other hand, the human government still in charge is made up of collaborators, who enforce the new rule of law, which includes strict curfews and oppressive surveillance. Soon, Will goes out to work and kisses his wife. It feels like more than just a normal goodbye kiss, and that puzzles her. A radio announcer is heard saying that new transportation passes are required by the fifth of the month, and encourages everyone to pick up their passes as early as possible. In the following scene, Will is at a workshop where he works as a garage mechanic with colleagues Carlos and Parco. Parco tells them that his brother has been taken and sent to the factory which is a slave labor facility on the moon. Soon afterwards, Will and Carlos load a van, which is clearly not for a routine delivery. When Will tells Carlos that he can come with him if he wants to, Carlos declines but asks him to pass a message to his family members and gives him a slip of paper. On the road there are very few motor vehicles, mostly push bicycles. Will has to stop at a roadblock controlled by the Homeland Security Agency, also known as Red Hats. However, he gets through with no problems. At a car park, Will pays a man and is given a Santa Monica 499 in exchange for his ID. Will is hidden in a freezer in the back of a truck with the man, and they are covered with an insulating blanket and a layer of ice. Inside the freezer is a small screen so that they can see what is happening outside. Will tells him that he's looking for his son who has just turned 12 in Santa Monica. At the gateway, the truck is scanned and gets a driver for the Santa Monica area. The lead drivers wait at the gateway. Just as planned, the scan doesn't pick up the two men hiding in the back and the truck drives off. As it's clearing the compound, a large explosion throws Will and the man around and out of the freezer. The other man, the spider, is dead and Will climbs up and out of the lorry where he is captured by red hats and airborne drones. Elsewhere, Katie cycles down the road with their family dog, Minnie, running alongside her. She stops to look at a wall covered with pictures of missing people, but is moved along by a red hat. A little later she witnesses a man being arrested by some other red hats. He is dragged out of a roadside cafe and bundled into a troop transport. Following this, Katie goes into a house, leaving Minnie outside. She meets a woman called Helois and asks her if she makes insulin. Helois replies that she does, and Katie agrees to buy some for a bottle of Glenlivet whiskey. Katie knows that insulin needs to be kept cool, and that medical quality insulin is clear. But the liquid in the bottle Helois has given her is warm and cloudy. At best it's very spoiled. As a result, Katie has to hold a pistol on Helis to get her whiskey back and then has to threaten people with the gun so that she can leave. She then takes Minnie and cycles off. At school, Abraham is trading as well, swapping lunch with his friend. An older student, Jackson turns up, asking for his cut of whatever is being traded. Abraham appears to agree but then hits Jackson with his backpack, and he and his friends shove him to the ground. They run off shouting and taunting him when the teaching staff arrive. Meanwhile, Will is in a holding cell with some other men. He shouts at the red hat guards that he wants a phone call but doesn't get one. At home, Kate and Bram are worrying about Will. Maddie, Katie's sister, arrives and is upset that Katie couldn't get the insulin. She only has a week's supply left. Katie tries to reassure her and asks her to stay as Will hasn't arrived home and she wants to go out to look for him. They are both worried that it's nearly curfew, but she goes anyway. She goes to see Carlos and asks about Will but Carlos doesn't tell her anything. As she starts on her way back, curfew starts and she has to hide under a military vehicle, which only drives away when the red hats come back with their prisoner and drive off. The prisoner, a man, sees her but doesn't give her away. After a while, Katie arrives home and tells them what has happened and that she doesn't know where Will is. The next day she goes to see an old colleague of Will's. Both she and Will had to go change their names after the arrival. He tells her to check the hospitals and that he will make some calls. At the hospital, she hears about the explosion at the gateway and asks about Will. She takes an opportunity to steal some insulin from a fridge. The nurse returns and tells her that Will isn't there. She rings Will's friend and asks, in a very guarded way, what happened. 
He replies in the same guarded way and tries to reassure her. In the meantime, Will is identified as Will Bowman and taken to Alan Snyder, the proxy governor. Snyder wants Will to give him the leader of the resistance, Geronimo, in return for the lives of his family. Following this, Will arrives home in a red hat transport and scares his wife. When she gets over her relief at getting him back, she yells at him for his choices, and Will yells back. In the morning they are woken by Snyder cooking breakfast in their kitchen. He offers them luxuries, bacon, coffee, tutors for the children and protection in return for Will's services. Will says he wants his son back and Snyder replies with a cryptic quote saying that good things come only to loyal people. Later on, Katie goes to see someone. It turns out to be the resistance. She tells them that Will has taken the job with Snyder and that this gives them someone on the inside, her. In the next scene, Carlos, a mechanic who works alongside Will Bowman at the Atco garage, his wife and son are collecting food rations. They go back to the garage and there, they climb inside Carlos' RV. Seeing his wife is worried, Carlos reassures her before he goes to work. However, while he's inside, a drone and then Homeland Security turn up, outside the garage. In a matter of minutes, the red hats go in, shots are fired and Carlos is arrested. Fortunately, his wife and son are still in the RV, hiding in a storage compartment under the bed. From there they see Carlos being taken away. Meanwhile, Katie returns home on her bicycle with the dog and sees an official car on their driveway. In the house, Madeline is giving Gracie and Hudson a meal. She asks Katie where she's been for so long but Katie is evasive. She goes upstairs and wakes while he's sleeping late. She then asks what he did on his first day working for Homeland Security and asks about the car. Later that day, Will goes to a meeting with Phillies, his new boss at Homeland Security, and is given his ID card by Jennifer McMahon, a staff at Homeland Security who mines information on the resistance. Phillies introduces herself but doesn't give her last name. She then gives him his first case, to find and detain Andrew Hines who's wanted for bombing the gateway, and introduces him to Bo, a detective at the agency. In the meantime, Katie goes to the Yonk, her bar that had to close after the arrival and starts to clean it up. A member of the resistance named Browsard visits and tells her that the resistance wants to know how close Homeland Security are to catching the cell that bombed the gateway. Elsewhere, Will and Bo go looking for Andrew Hines at his girlfriend's apartment. Hines is scared into running and Will catches him behind the apartment building. They take him in. Maddie is working as a waitress at a party where she meets someone. George, whom she used to know before the arrival. They leave the party together and go to his house which is in the green zone. As Will is taking Hines to detention, he sees Carlos in the holding cell and they talk. Will promises to look after Carlos' family and to get Carlos himself out of there. He then goes to Phillies and tries to get Carlos released as an informant. Later on, Will goes to the garage where blood is being washed off the walls and looks for Carlo's wife and son in the RV. However, they aren't there. Katie and Gracie are playing a board game at the kitchen table when Carlo's family turns up at the door asking for help. Katie goes to Browsard who refuses to help, saying that the resistance doesn't have the resources to help people. At George's house, Maddie has just got out of the shower and dressed. She goes into the kitchen where George is packing a box of food for her and it becomes obvious that George won't be seeing her again. Despite not being pleased, she takes the food. On the other hand, Will arrives home and takes Carlo's family to get new IDs. On the way, they are stopped by a security patrol who apologize and let them carry on as soon as they see Will's ID card. The husband and wife take Lucia to get fake IDs at a place where they're obviously known and trusted. After arranging for new IDs, Will leads Lucia and Matteo down some stairs to what looks like an underground car park with tents filled with people. Lucia is very nervous but the leader of the camp tries to reassure her. Meanwhile, Katie meets Keel in a park. He's reading a book while sitting at a table and Katie sits with him, quite openly. Browsard is standing a little way off, watching them. At one point Keel turns and looks at him as if asking Browsard's permission for something, and the latter nods. Keel then asks her what she knows about the gateway bombing investigation, and she tells him about Andrew Hines' arrest. Keel tells her how that bombing really could lead the investigation to them, and that they need to know what's going on to help them hide. Eventually, Katie agrees to give them information on the investigation. It's dark by the time Will gets back to check on Carlos, and he discovers that the prisoners in the holding cells, including Carlos, have been sent to the factory. Will does get to see Carlos on the bus before the latter gets shipped out. He tells Carlos that his family are safe, but Carlos is still bitter and resentful of Will not being able to save him. Will then watches the buses leave for the factory as the curfew siren sounds. Later still, at home, Katie reassures her husband that he's doing the right thing and that it's not his fault he couldn't help Carlos. They're interrupted by a radio call from Bo. 
Bo tells him that they've located the bombing suspects, and need Will there. Katie overhears the message and runs to a public phone booth as soon as Will has gone. She then calls Browsard and tells him where the suspects are. In the meantime, Carlos and the other prisoners have arrived at an unknown location. They're told to strip and get into what looks like showers. Ultraviolet light and chemicals sanitize them and, wearing surgical gowns and masks, they walk out into a brightly lit area. On the other hand, Will gets to where the operation to catch the bombing suspects is going on. He and Bo search the building and find the suspects. However, everyone there is dead, shot in the head. Geronimo is painted on the walls by the bodies. Will realizes that they have a leak, but he doesn't know it's his wife. Similarly, Katie doesn't know she probably got this group killed to stop them leading the authorities. To Keel's group, the scene shifts to a homeless man pushing a shopping cart, full of his possessions, along a street. He enters an abandoned building, walking past the no-entry sign. Once inside, he sets up a small radio transmitter and begins to broadcast. It is revealed that this is Geronimo. He is prepared. He has notes and times the broadcast carefully. The following scene shows the different people who listen to his broadcast. They include ordinary people at work and at home. Bram records the broadcast and labels the cassette before hiding a box of them away. Also listening are the occupation forces, who are triangulating the broadcast in an attempt to catch Geronimo. By the time the Red Hats get there, Geronimo is long gone. However, he does leave them a note. At the other end of the city, Katie is cycling along a street with another woman. The woman reassures her that things will go well. When they get to their destination, several men check and load weapons on a truck. A young Asian man, Justin Kim, gives Katie's companion an assault rifle and Katie a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Soon, Browsard briefs everyone and reassures Katie, telling her that she'll be great. Later, a truck driven by two Red Hats is ambushed as it drives under an overpass and is hidden from the air. Suddenly, a random cab stops nearby and the driver and his mate get out of the vehicle. They pull the dead body from under the wheels of the truck only to find that it's a dummy. Without warning, they come under attack by Brassard's group. Katie times each stage with two stopwatches, stopping and starting them when her boss says to. Browser then takes a radio from the driver, makes a rescue call, tells Katie to start the clock, and fires into the air, to test how fast the occupation can respond. Unexpectedly, two red hats jump from the back of the truck and attack the resistance group. They and the two red hats from the cab are killed but not before they've shot and wounded Justin Kim of the resistance. As soon as the red hats are dead, people from the crowd start to empty the truck of food. Katie tries to help Kim but is called away by Browsard who kills him with another two shots. The resistance group make their escape, leaving the crowd looting the truck to be killed by two drones. From their hiding place, Browsard tells Katie to stop a stopwatch as Homeland Security SUVs arrive. Later, Katie arrives home on her bike, blood-stained and obviously shaken. Lindsay, the children's tutor, asks if she's okay as Katie rushes upstairs to take a shower. As she's about to enter the bathroom, Katie hears will call out from downstairs. She hurries in and cleans the blood off, takes the rest of her clothes off and stops her husband from asking any questions by making love with him in the bathroom. After, she shuts herself alone in the bathroom to avoid his questions about what has happened. At school, Bram's class finishes and Pia turns him down for lunch. As he leaves the class, the teacher calls him back and Bram gives him a copy of the tape he made earlier. The teacher tells Bram about his telescope and how something very large in Earth's orbit blocked out the pole star the night before. At the scene of the ambush, Will and Bo are investigating. Will reconstructs the timeline of the incident pretty well and picks out Kim's body, because he can see that someone had tried to give him first aid. He realizes that Kim was helped and then executed. They ID him as part of the resistance cell. Soon after, Phillies turns up and talks with Will, and agrees to ID the body and leaves. Later, at Kim's house, Browsard sees Will talking to a woman as Kim's parents are put in the vehicle. Browsard leaves and goes straight to Kiel who is practicing at a makeshift rifle range set up in the empty swimming pool of a disused community center. He tells Kiel about the ambush, and about Kim's death. They discuss how the occupation could have beaten Browsard to Kim's parents' house, and whether or not Kim himself could lead the authorities to the group. Meanwhile, Will goes home early to see how Katie is, but she makes up a story about why she was upset. He tells her about Kim's parents. He's upset and doesn't see the effect he's having on Katie who's very shaken. He reassures her by saying that she can tell him anything but she leaves the room. The next morning, Katie meets with the woman who was with her on the ambush. She tries to reassure Katie and tells her she will get used to it. Browsard is there as well and she challenges him about Justin's killing. She tells him that she has information from Will that Kim's parents have been taken. Browsard wants to know if they've given information to the occupation, 
but Katie has no idea about it. Hence, Browser tells her to find out and Katie walks away without a word. At school, Pia finds Bram and takes him to an abandoned building near the wall that used to be operated by the Department of Water and Power. Pia has the keys because of her father's job. She takes Bram down a tunnel to where her cousin, Pedro, has hurt himself and can't get out of the tunnels without help. Pia then shows Bram a ladder that leads up out of the other side of the wall to the rest of the world. She also tells him that there are no people there now and that she and Pedro have been going to the other side for about six months for food. Meanwhile, Katie and Maddie get home and are greeted by Lindsay who tells them that their privacy is very important to her and that she would never break it. She also lets Katie know that she knew how upset Katie was that morning. However, Katie doesn't appear to attach much importance to this. At Will's office, Phillies has been researching Justin Kim using the computer database they call the Rolodex. She has several leads for Jennifer, Will and Bo to investigate. Jennifer sends them to the community center where they find the rifle range and weapons. On the other hand, Keel is livid about the loss of the weapons and wants Will killed but Broussard argues that Will is an important resource. Keel asks to pass a message to Katie, notifying her that the intelligence she supplies has to be more important than the damage her husband does. Hence, Broussard goes to the Yonk where Katie is preparing for the reopening and tells her this. That evening, there's a cue to get into the Yonk. The reopening is a success, even when Snyder arrives and lets everyone know he's allowing this to happen. After overhearing a conversation between Snyder and Will, Katie disappears to a room in the back and Will has to go and find her. The husband and wife have a heated argument. The stress of working for the resistance and having to keep it from Will is telling on Katie, and Will is very unhappy with the things he's part of at work. After a while, Browsard appears again and Katie makes him pay for his bottle of beer. Katie tells him about the Rolodex and he gives her his word that Will won't be harmed. It's not clear how, or if, he plans to keep this promise. The scene then shifts to a helmet cam footage. It shifts from a Red Hat's changing room and then on the way to a door knocking mission at a high school. The wearer of the helmet cam is being called Deke by his colleagues. At the school, the platoon of Red Hats detain a teacher whose crime seems to be that she's used a Ray Bradbury novel in class. One member of the platoon hits a male student in the face with the butt of his rifle, while another member slams the teacher's head into her desk, throws her to the floor, and then points a weapon at the students. They take the teacher out to the waiting armored vehicle, as she begs them not to. Back at the changing room, Deke puts his helmet on the shelf in his locker. As Deke takes off his ski mask, it is revealed that Deke is none other than Browsard. Katie's younger sister, Madeline, is getting dressed for the day. She takes great care about which dress she chooses and with her makeup. On the sofa nearby, her son, Hudson, is still asleep. After a while, she gives Hudson breakfast and an insulin shot. She then takes him through to the main house for his lessons with Will and Katie's youngest daughter, Gracie. In the kitchen, Katie asks Madeline if she's got anything special today because she looks dressed up. However, Madeline cryptically answers that they will see what happens. At Homeland Security HQ, Will knocks on Philly's door. She calls him in and shows him an organization chart of the insurgency. It shows Geronimo in the center and many cells operating independently. She tells him that most in the Transitional Authority, an occupying organization that controls Los Angeles, believe that there's a single controlling figure in the insurgency. She doesn't believe there is but sees a great risk to the Transitional Authority if the opposing forces were to unify. She does see a great risk to the people in the lab block if the hosts, a largely unseen, mysterious occupying force that invaded and occupied Los Angeles and elsewhere during the arrival, were to retaliate. In the meantime, Katie sees the two children and Lindsay off to the park, saying that she has work to do and can't go. She then walks around the house, collecting a doll and a valued picture. She checks through the window then turns on the outside light above the front door. She immediately goes through to the kitchen where she sees a person in black run past the kitchen window. She waits, then hears glass smashing in the other part of the house, and hears the sound of a fire starting. She counts to five and then takes the fire extinguisher from under the sink, right by where she was standing. Next, she walks through to the dining room, where a small fire has already seen off the curtain and is fast becoming bigger. She then finishes counting to ten and then, quite calmly, puts the fire out and calls her husband. When Will gets home, the emergency medical team are looking after Katie, and Red Hats are searching the house. Will's objections to the search don't get him far and Katie has to go to Homeland Security HQ to answer some questions. At the HQ, she's treated as a guest, with Phillies herself asking the questions. Phillies also lets her know that Katie's neighbors are being intimidated into protecting the Bowman family and will be held responsible if any harm comes to them. Two neighbors, Patrick and Joanna Hart from Two Doors Down are made responsible for organizing patrols. A couple of times during the interview, Phillies seems to be about to give Katie a hard time over inconsistencies in her story. 
but she backs down each time. Phillies knows Katie and Will's backgrounds very well and lets her know that. After the interview, Will takes his wife back home. While this is happening, Maddie is going through the security checks needed to enter the green zone. She gets assigned to a woman, Charlotte Burgess, who is responsible for distributing artwork. Initially, Burgess is unimpressed with Maddie and gives her some filing to do. On the other hand, Will goes into Philly's office and wants to know what has happened. The duo talk about the lies they're forced to tell about how great the hosts are. But Phillies puts Will at ease and then tells him that they found tapes of Geronimo's broadcasts in Bram's room. She makes it plain that she won't release those tapes and ends up destroying them. Elsewhere, the whole neighborhood sees Katie arrive home in a Homeland Security SUV. The door opened for her by a very respectful red hat. Inside, Lindsay is looking after the children and Gracie runs and hugs her mother. Katie thanks the tutor and lets her go for the day. When Will gets home he tells Bram off and makes him reveal when to tape the broadcasts. That evening, Katie goes to see Keel who asks her to identify Will's boss. Katie does this after getting the same promise from Keel that she already had from Brassard that Will won't be touched. The following day, during a broadcast, Will manages to arrest Geronimo at a library. He takes him, hooded, back to Homeland Security HQ. However, Will doesn't believe that the man he's arrested is the leader of the resistance. Yet he and Bo hand him over to the people who will interrogate the suspect. However, they look more like medics than a police interrogation team. Upstairs, Alan Snyder is bragging to Phillies about how he's told the hosts that Geronimo has been captured. However, Phillies grills him and makes him admit that he didn't talk to the hosts directly, but through someone called Helena. When Will tells them that he doubts that the man they've arrested is the mastermind of the insurgency, Snyder is visibly worried. Elsewhere, Madeline has finished her filing and is listening to a conversation between Charlotte Burgess and a male assistant. They're concerned that they don't have an important enough piece to give to someone called Georgina Hamilton. Suddenly, Madeline butts into the conversation and reveals that she's aware of where a lot of important artwork is held. This revelation makes Burgess very interested in Maddie. Meanwhile, Will is searching an area with Jennifer McMahon, Bo and some red hats. The person they had arrested on suspicion of being Geronimo had told them that this is where he got the scripts to broadcast. However, Will is doubtful of this. But soon, Bo finds a small tunnel with a trolley arrangement that could be used to deliver or collect small items, like a script for broadcast. Will looks at the area the tunnel goes in and realizes that its other end must be in the green zone. In the meantime, Charlotte Burgess and Maddie are sitting, drinking wine when the artwork arrives back from where Madeline said it would be. Burgess is impressed and wants to know where other artwork is being held. Madeline is willing to reveal the information in return for a job and a guaranteed insulin supply for her son, an offer that Burgess agrees to immediately. After Charlotte Burgess leaves the room, her husband, Nolan arrives. It is quite obvious that he is attracted to Madeline. Taking advantage of this, Madeline bends over facing away from him while picking up her bag, with her back arched for just a moment longer than necessary. Back at work, Will is telling Phillies about the little tunnel they've found. She is pleased and tells him that she's destroyed his son's tapes. But, Will's not sure he believes her and leaves for the day. At home, he finds Katie cleaning up after the fire, and they talk about their days and about their children. He asks about the file labeled the beachphoto.png that Katie moved before the room was firebombed. In response, she tells him the file is safe, but doesn't expand further. When Katie leaves for the yonk, Will searches for the file until he finds it. After a while, Katie arrives at the yonk to open up for the night and finds Phillies already there. She has been waiting at the bar with a drink for them both. Phillies talks about inconsequential things for a minute. The name of the bar, about a trip she took with her husband at the beginning of their marriage, and a very personal detail about when she worked in Ireland. Then she tells her she knows about Katie's involvement with the resistance, and that she, Katie, works for her now. This stuns Katie who can say nothing but stares at her. Following this, Phillies is driven to her home in the green zone past all of the security checks. When she gets home, she tells her driver to return at 8.30 in the morning. As she walks in, she takes a call on a satellite phone in which she talks about Snyder and about Katie. At one point she says that she doesn't know as their perception of time makes that unpredictable. It's not clear who or what she's referring to. After a while, she goes to her husband's room and talks to him, asking about his day, telling him about hers. Her husband, Ed, is sitting up in bed not responding to her. It is clear that Ed had a serious stroke at some time in the past. She then leaves him for a moment, saying that she'll be right back and that they'll read together. Following this, Phillies walks into a darkened room and turns on the light. 
To her surprise, Broussard is there in his red hat uniform. She sees him stand and calmly asks him to shoot her husband as well. Broussard kills her without a word, then walks into the bedroom where she'd left at a moment before. As the credits begin to roll in, we hear two more shots. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments if you'd like us to continue part 2. Thank you.